give the kind of itinerary for the day as such. Uh, we have Jacqueline Grogan from the HSC who's going to be discussing and uh, doing a presentation on the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act and the, the commencement and implement, uh, implementation of that over the next couple of months. Uh, we also have Brefany McGuinness from the Irish Hospice Foundation who will be talking about grief in the workplace. And we also have our own Dominic Campbell as well from the Irish Hospital Foundation who's doing, will be doing his section as well on the, the arts and wellbeing tools for frontline staff as well. well. I'm going to introduce uh, Jacqueline Grogan now who's coming on to speak about our Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act uh, 2015 and what we can expect going forward. So thank you. Thanks Mark and good afternoon everybody. Um, it's We're halfway through the week now, the world is looking good. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel for Friday. Um, so I'm going to do a kind of a brief presentation. Um, so this is where we keep fingers crossed that technology actually works. Because um, no matter how many times you do this, there's always that um, nervousness that it's not actually working. Um, so hopefully you can see that as a proper slideshow. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. So thank you. Um, I, so I'm from the HSE National Office for Human Rights and Equality Policy, and we're based in what's called strategy and research within the HSE. And we would have um, a range of um, programmes under um, our, our remit, including the HSE national consent policy. We also cover transgender and intersex policy issues, universal access for people with disabilities. But as you can imagine, one of the big pieces of work that we're working on at the moment is around the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act and kind of getting prepared for implementation and commencement of the Act. So when you look at the Act, it's, it's, it's a dense document. Like the Act in itself at the moment is 150 something pages long. And I think that, that one of the problems and one of the fears that, that the people have is how am I actually going to implement all this in practice? It is very kind of information intensive and very legalistic as well. So part of what our office has been doing over the last few years um, since 2016 is trying to look at what it actually says in the Act and working out exactly what it means for practice and what the key messages for staff actually are around the Act. But as you can imagine, there's been a few things and a few hurdles, particularly in the last couple of years that have got in our way with the work that we've been doing. Um, COVID has had a huge impact and it's one of these things that they think where beforehand we would have gone out and done these presentations to people face to face and myself and my colleagues would have traveled all over the country during 2016, 17, 18 and 19 talking to people. We very quickly when COVID hit had to kind of change our approach to how we were kind of supporting people around this and, and moved lots of things onto kind of an online format. Um, and I'll talk a bit later on about some of the resources that we've developed and where you can get access to them um, later. And then to make things just even a bit more fun, um, we decided to throw a cyber attack in just as we thought we were finding our feet again after kind of COVID kind of slightly calmed down, we were starting to kind of get lots of engagement and then all of a sudden we get hit with a cyber attack. Um, and obviously the impact that that's had has been huge and it prevented an awful lot of people from being able to access some of our resources last year um, that we were developing. And, and, and in some ways we kind of stalled the work that we were doing as well because we couldn't do a lot of our stuff because of the cyber attack. But since then we've been back up and running and firing on all cylinders and we have a massive amount of resources and things available to people that I'll talk about shortly. So just for those of you who don't know about the Act, I'm sure probably all of you do, I'm just going to quickly run through some of the key components of the Act. I'm not going to kind of mull over these too much and if you're looking for more information on these there is a short presentation available on the our website assisteddecisionmaking.ie where you get to listen to me talking for 20 minutes about what the act is actually about um, and going into much more detail about each of these key components but the main ones are the kind of the, the functional approach to, to decision making capacity and putting that on a statutory footing um, the establishment of the Decision Support Service, who's a bit like the oversight body for this act, and they have a role around public awareness and codes of practice and a number of other things. I'll be touching on some of them later on. The revision of the enduring power of attorney system um, and bringing in kind of advanced healthcare directives as well. And I'm sure many of you on this call have an interest in advanced healthcare directives. And I think my colleague Marie Tig might have been with you previously talking about um, advanced healthcare directives and what the act actually means for them. The Act also allows a number of legally recognised persons to support people to make decisions. So if your decision making capacity is in question, may shortly be called into question or you lack capacity, 
you can get support from decision making assistant or a co decision maker. Both of them are personal appointments, so you decide who you want to take on those roles. And the decision making representative, which is a court appointment, um, and the decision making representative is for when you lack capacity for a particular decision. And I think that's the big kind of key thing about this act is the, 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 the kind of the decision specific nature of the act. So it's about a particular decision at a particular time. It's not that blanket lacking capacity um, that we currently have with the wardship system. There's also the enduring power of attorney and the designated healthcare representative. Um, so we have the, the kind of the, the attorney power, enduring power of attorney system has been revised and, and you can appoint what's called a designated healthcare representative through your advanced healthcare directive. And obviously the abolition of the wardship system, which is a huge piece of work. And um, so we're finally repealing the Lunacy Regulations Ireland Act of 1871 and hopefully bringing it much more up to date in order for us to meet our commitments in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this is where things freeze. It's important to remember as well that the Act is a disability neutral act. So there is nowhere in the Act that says that you need to have a particular diagnosis in order for the Act to be relevant for you, which is a big change and is very different from an awful lot of legislation that's in a similar area in different jurisdictions. So in the England and Wales Mental Capacity Act, you need to have a diagnosis um, of the impairment of mind or brain, whereas this Act doesn't have that. So it just means it equally applies to all of us on this call as it does maybe to the people that we work with on a day to day basis. And I think it's important to remember that it just reminds us that we all need support at some times and that in certain times and in certain situations, some people just need a little bit more support in order to make those particular decisions. And it's funny because I was talking to somebody recently about a fairly big decision that I had to make. And even when you think about your own decision making, like a lot of the time we go and we talk to our family members, our friends, our supporters. If it's something to do with medical treatment, we might go and talk to some of our colleagues about it just to kind of tease that out. So in some ways, we all implement the principles of the act daily when we're making big decisions anyway. But sometimes in a lot of it, in certain services or just time pressures, we maybe don't allow people that kind of freedom to get that support um, to make their own particular decisions. So commencement is June 2022. We know that it is definitely happening in June 2022. There has been ministerial commitment to June 2022. And in some ways, it feels like that's only just around the corner because it kind of is. Um, and in some ways, that's kind of ner makes you nervous, makes you excited, because I think this is just it's going to be a phenomenal piece of um, legislation for, for people. But it is that way where it's about, OK, so what does it mean for me? What do I need to be doing? And I think for, for, for staff and for services, your starting point has to be that presumption of capacity. So you need to presume that everybody has capacity to make their own decisions, um, unless you can prove, that, prove otherwise. So you need to presume that they have decision-making capacity to consent or refuse the treatment. You, you need to kind of, you, the person doesn't have to prove their capacity to make a decision, because an awful lot of the time when I've been talking to kind of people who use our services, they feel that that bar is maybe set higher for them because they have an underlying condition. So we, we, they don't have to prove their capacity to make that decision. And making an unwise decision doesn't necessarily mean that they lack capacity to make that decision. Now, at this point in time, normally, if I was in front of you and in a hall with however many people in front of me, I would turn around and say, so can, can somebody put your hand up if you can honestly say that you have never made a decision that somebody else has thought would be unwise in your lifetime? I make decisions that my husband thinks is unwise all the time. Normally it involves spending and using money and buying handbags and shoes. Um, we all make those kind of decisions. And but our ability, our, our, our capacity to make those decisions isn't necessarily questioned. Whereas for some people, it gets questioned all the time. And I think that's, that's kind of where we need to move away from. The Act also says we need to support the person to make the decision. So there is kind of the Act places an onus on health and social care professionals to support somebody to make a decision. So they need to have the information in the right way that will help them to make the decision. Are you asking them in the right place and at the right time? Are you in the middle of a busy ward where there's lots of noise going on in the background? Can you leave the information with the person so that they can take time to digest the information themselves? Have you given it to them in a format that they can understand? So 
I, like one of the examples that, that I get told regularly is around um, kind of patient information leaflets for surgery, where there's an awful lot of medical terminology, but nobody sits down and explains to the person what that medical terminology is. So is there a way that you can use, you can redevelop or look at your, your, your information that you're giving to patients to make sure that it's easier for them to understand? Um, obviously, getting an interpreter, if needed, whether that's sign language interpreter or, or a language interpreter. And just to say that the, the Irish Sign Language Act of 2017 actually put an onus on the, health, the, the HSE to bring in interpreters for people who are deaf if they request them. So is there a way you can give them as visual? Can you draw something? Can you help them to understand it? Do you have easy read versions? It's all about, and these are all things that we should, that, are not, that services could be doing anyway. And it's already legislated for within the Equal Status Act. I think this act just gives us another push and another drive in order to be able to kind of do this as well. Ask the person if they want a relative or a friend to, to accompany them, to help them understand that information. I think there's kind of this perception of the act that this act means no family, whereas I, I think actually the act means use the family. The family is probably the best person there to support the person to understand the information and they would be the best people to know what that person's will and preference is. So use the family to help support them to make a decision. And can you give them the information in advance? Can, can they have the time to sit down and read the information? I know that sometimes it can be very difficult in some circumstances, but in others it's not. And I think there is that kind of thing where it's like we need to give you the information now because we're seeing you and don't get the time and, and a good example that I have was I actually had to recently go in for um, a procedure and the hospital that I was with actually sent me all the patient information leaflets to my house two days two weeks before the, 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 the procedure was due to take place so that I then had time to, to read them to understand them and I could go back to them if I had questions as well so thinking about things like that but the act is all about supporting the person it's not about assessing capacity. The assessing capacity piece should be much further down the line and it should be much later in the kind of your journey with the person. Um, and that's why capacity is in brackets within the title of the act because the, the assisting people is first, the capacity piece is secondary. But the act is also about putting the person at the center of their own decisions. So it's it kind of taking that the disability mantra of nothing about me without me that, that this is what the act is all about it's about helping the person who may need support to make their own decisions and putting them at the center of their own decision making ability and as i said it's not about excluding families families are people's biggest advocates they are people's biggest drivers they're big, people's biggest supporters and they play a very key role within this act and i think that they need to be supported within to kind of understand what this act means for them as well. So in terms of what's happening at the moment, um, as I said at the start, our office also has oversight of the HSE national consent policy. Um, and we um, recent yesterday, I, no Monday, gosh, I have no idea what day it is anymore. <laughs> Back on Monday, we launched a revised HSE National Consent Policy and a supporting e-learning program. The, the, the e-learning program is available on HSE land. You'll be able to access that now. And one of the biggest changes that we did within the policy was we brought it up to date with a lot of the kind of changes in legislation and policy that's happened over the years since it was initially written back in 2013. But what we've done this time round is put an awful lot of emphasis on the importance of the will and preference of the person who may lack capacity so that the consent policy aligns with the guiding principles of the Assisted Decision Making Act. We hope to have that consent policy up on the website uh, later today, if not first thing tomorrow morning. Um, but I think that what's really important is that if you implement the principles of the national consent policy, you're also implementing the principles of the Act. You're halfway there. And like no, nothing within the act, I think, is theory. So if you can input, say that you're implementing the consent policy, then you're definitely well on the way to being prepared for implementing the act. So as I said, the core principles of the national consent policy haven't changed. Um, it's all about emphasizing, supporting people to make their own decisions. It's the importance of their preference, wishes, and beliefs of the person who lacks capacity that presumption of capacity and the functional approach and respecting advanced healthcare directives and refusal of treatments. 
So that's all very much in related and interlinked to what's in the Assisted Decision Making Act. So I think that, as I said, if you can do if you do consent properly, you're doing the principles of the act as well. In terms of other things that are happening around preparation for commencement, um, the Decision Support Service in November and in January would have put out a number of codes of practice um, for consultation on different aspects of the Act. Um, I think there were 16 codes of practice in total and they would have received a large amount of feedback on those um, codes and they are currently integrating the feedback and hope, I think, that they're planning on having the final codes of practice published late May, early June, but I could be wrong on that one. Um, but I do know that they received lots of feedback and I'm sure that there's a number of you probably on this call who submitted your feedback as well to that, that consultation. Um, they're also currently recruiting a number of panels that are required under the Act. Um, so they're recruiting for the panel of decision-making representatives. So that's for when maybe somebody doesn't have a family member who can take on that role or if it's a particularly complex um, decision that needs to be made, they might take it off of a panel. So you might have a solicitor maybe taking on that role of DMR. Um, but they're also recruiting for what's called special visitors and general visitors under the Act. So that's it's, it's kind of putting the building blocks in place for the Act being commenced later this year. The Act is also going through some amendments at the moment. So there is a bill working its way through the House called the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Amendment Bill of 2021. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and the, the role of that is to kind of improve some of the processes and safeguards um, for those who are in the Act who might need the decision making support within the Act. So the general scheme of the bill was referred to the Joint or Office Committee on, let me get this right because I always forget one of them, Children, Disability, Equality, Integration and Youth um, for pre-legislated scrutiny in November and they then opened it up to a public consultation in January this year. Um, and actually, they had a number of committee meetings based on the feedback that they received in February. And if you're interested, you can watch um, those committee meetings back. The recordings are online. Um, and they would have had presentations at those from organisations like the Federation of Voluntary Bodies, um, Mental Health Reform presented, um, the Decision Support Service, um, the department was there as well, Family Carers Ireland, and a number of other organisations. So it's quite an in interesting to kind of listen to what their views were of the of the amendment legislation as well. As I said at the beginning, it is a huge piece of legislation. It's a big piece of work. And I think the only way that you can kind of manage to kind of prepare for, for an act like this is is that whole kind of thing about how do you eat, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. I think if we looked at it as a whole, we would kind of get swamped and we would feel completely overwhelmed. So we're very much coming at it from one bite at a time, but that doesn't mean we're taking things slowly. We have a number of resources already available on our website for staff. So our website is www.assisteddecisionmaking.ie. Up on the website at the moment, we have a short explainer video on the act. It's about eight minutes long um, and it has people who work in services and people who the act affects talking about what the act means for me um, so it's quite powerful and able to impact on your life um, we also have a number of recordings of different webinars um, on the act um, on key provisions including supporting decision making advanced planning the role of advocacy under the act and all of those recordings are up on the website and available for you to watch at your leisure um, we have a quarterly newsletter that we issue that updates not just about kind of the work that we're doing around the Act, but also the work of the office as a whole, so around the consent policy and the other human rights issues that we would have spoken about there. Um, in November, we published um, a collection of essays um, called um, the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act Personal and Professional Reflections. And these essays are written from both the personal and professional perspectives of people highlighting the importance of the Act and what the Act means for them. Um, it's a very, very good book. It's one that you can kind of dip in and out of, read different chapters um, as and when you want, and it's free to download off of our website as well. We've recently put up a number of frequently asked questions. Um, so there's a section on the website with frequently asked questions that you can go in and out of. So if there's particular things that you're wanting to know and particular things you're wanting kind of clarity on, have a look there. Um, that's probably the best place for you to start. Um, and as I said, for those of you who want kind of that 
kind of basic level of understanding of the act, we do have a presentation recording, which is me chatting away for 20 minutes and um, talking about the act and um, what it means and the different structures in the act and the different supports in the act and things like that. As I said, we're not done. Um, so currently in development, we are developing an, a new suite of e-learning um, for, for HSE land. Um, one of them will be kind of an oversight of the Act and the importance of the guiding principles, ones around the interveners in the Act, um, and the third one will be on advanced healthcare directives. And we're hoping that they'll be available towards the middle to the end of this year, so we're kind of full flow kind of getting them ready to go. The reason these have been delayed and that because the reason we, ha we haven't been able to start them before now is because we hadn't seen the codes of practice and we hadn't seen what the amending legislation was going to look like. But now that we have seen them and we have an idea about what, what's going to be there, we're kind of full flow getting ready to, to get these out as soon as we possibly can. They're also in the process of developing a number of implementation plans. Um, so there's going to be an overarching implementation plan for the HSE that's being developed. And two separate pieces of work that are currently going on with HSE disability services and one with HSE mental health, kind of looking at this particular nuance that the Act has um, for the, those particular services. We're going to be developing guidance on the Act. Um, so this will be based on what's in the Code of Practice, um, kind of in building on what's included in the Code of Practice that are going to be published by the Decision Support Service. But we recognise that people need information and guidance on how to apply these in, in, on their, in their day to day work. So we are in the middle of starting to draft some of that guidance at the moment. And we have a number of webinars that are ongoing um, around. So we have a webinar series at the moment and we've done two so far. Uh, one is on um, how to interact with the interveners and one's on when to engage with the decision support service. And again, both of them will, are available on the website. So you can watch them back at your leisure. Um, so there's lots and lots of stuff going on. In terms of how you can prepare for commencement, we have a mailing list. Um, so you can register for our mailing list at adm at hse.ie. Um, through that mailing list, we'll keep you up to date on all of the events that we're hosting, any of the information that needs to go out, you'll get our, our quarterly newsletter. Um, so there's lots of kind of benefits to, to kind of registering to sign up to the mailing list. Um, there's all the resources I've spoken about on assisteddecisionmaking.ie, but there's also the Decision Support Service have a range of resources available on their website as well, including their own explainer video um, and a number of recorded um, in kind of um, presentations that have been done with them um, on the Flynn, who's the director of the Decision Support Service, and they are recently been put up onto their website. We have three e-learning programs, which we're actually launching next week um, on the 7th of April. Um, if you'd like to get information about how to register for that, it's up on our website. So we'll have three modules, one on supporting persons to make decisions, one on supporting people to plan for the future, and the third one is an introduction to the functional assessment of capacity. And they'll be available on HSE land from the 7th of April next week. Um, and we actually have Minister Rabbit coming to launch those um, e-learning programmes next week. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, as I said, we have the webinar series that's kind of continuing at the moment. Um, and obviously, familiarise yourself with the revised HSE national consent policy, because I think, and the e-learning programme, um, because I think they, as I said, they'll give you a really good grounding on, on what's happening. As I said, lots of upcoming events. So our e-learning is launching next week. Um, we, as I said, we're in the middle of a new webinar series. So the next webinar that we have is taking place on the 27th of April, and it's focusing on positive risk taking and unwise decisions. Um, there will be one in May focusing on the functional assessment of capacity and one in June about respecting the rights of the person and the role of the family under the Act. So I think they'll be really good um, webinars and the way that we've been structuring them so far is um, they've all been very much scenario based. So what we did was back in December, we sent an email out to our mailing list um, asking for people for situations where they think the act could have an impact. Give me an, an example of a situation where you, you think the act could help. And what we've been doing is we've been taking those scenarios and we have a panel of experts who are then talking through those scenarios from their own perspective. So it's quite interesting to kind of watch and, and listen back. Whenever I'm talking about the act, I always kind of 
come back to this quote because I think it's, it's a really powerful quote from, from Beamer and Brooks. And I think when you see that the date's 2001, when it was said, it just shows how long this kind of concept has, has been around for. It says that the starting point is not a test of capacity, but the presumption that every human being is communicating all the time and that this communication will include preferences. Preferences can be built up into expressions of choice and these into formal decisions. And from this perspective, where someone lands the continuum of capacity is not half as important as the amount and type of support that they get to build those preferences into choices. And I think that to me just screams, this is what the act is about. This is, this is why we have this act. It's to, to, to help people to build what those preferences are into choices. Um, and I think that the more that we can do, I think if we put ourselves in, in, in somebody else's shoes and how you would feel if it was you that was in that particular decision, I think that, that, that we would very much kind of hark back to that quote. So my email address is there. Um, we're a very small team. There's only five of us, but we're, we're trying to do as much Trojan work as we possibly can to help services get ready for commencement of the Act. And thank you for listening to me. Um, thank you, Jacqueline. That was great. Um, we, I suppose now is the moment if anyone does uh, have any questions that maybe like to, to, to put to Jacqueline, then um, now will be the time. Uh, we did have one question come in in the chat function there, right, about um, training and things like that. And you mentioned mm. a lot of it there, I think, on HUC land. Yeah. I suppose it's just to confirm that we do have a lot of um, maybe like private nursing homes and things that are here today, like that everybody gets equal access to that uh, on HUC land. You can access it, I think, from... I think most places, yeah. if they're, they can access HUC land, yes. So mm. I, I can see somebody yeah. nodding their heads for me as well. I so. think it I think I think you can set up an account and get into get access to it all right as far as I'm aware. Yeah. And things so, and so there's um, the and your webinar yeah. series and things that are coming up as well and all that training as well as the webinar is open the webinars are open to anybody. Um we we don't discriminate. Um so anybody that wants to, to attend the webinars is more than welcome and information to kind of sign up for them is available on the website as well. Um and as I said, if you go if you email us at adm at hse.ie we'll add you to our mailing list and you'll get information about everything as it's happening in anyway. Perfect. And we popped those, um, that email address is inside the chat function there for anybody who wants to, to make contact with you as well. Um, and we'll be sharing a lot of this information afterwards, again, in our follow-up yep. email, which are all email addresses and stuff and people can make contact if they're, if they're looking for you. I don't know That's if there's good. any other uh, questions coming in from anybody. I don't see any hands up or any questions coming in. Um, I think we're okay. So thank you very much, Jacqueline. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so and, much. Uh, I know we're looking forward to the, the, I'm sure everybody's looking forward to the, the, the this period of time was going to be a bit confusing and a bit of change for everybody. But, um, you know, it's great to have some resources that people are able to access freely. You know? So thank you very much. Yeah, and I think it is, it's a journey for people. And I think that's the important thing that you need to remember. I don't think that services are going to be able to change overnight. I think you need to think of this as being, as I said, it's that elephant. How how do you eat that elephant? So it's taking steps and just preparing and getting ready. So thank you very much for listening, everyone. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay. Um, so we shall start moving along. Um, our next uh, presenter is um, our own Brefni, uh, who's coming on here. So Brefni McGuinness from the Irish Hospice Foundation mm -hmm. is going to be coming on speaking about uh, grief in the workplace. So uh, you're there with us, Brefni, aren't you? I am indeed, Mark. Right. Thanks there very much. Are. Lovely stuff. And lovely to be here with you this afternoon. I am just going to uh, share some slides with you and hopefully everybody can see that okay. Mark, you might just we're tell not, me if that's coming not, through all right. We're not, we're not seeing it yet. Not yet. Okay. Oh, it'd help if I hit the right button, wouldn't it? Thank you for just checking. Ah, now we got it. Okay. So. Yep, we're seeing. The, you're seeing. It's, the, not a, it's not a presenter mode yet. There we go. Perfect. It's in presenter mode. There. Great. Thanks, Mark. And as I say, look, uh, lovely to be here with you this afternoon. And I'm going to be talking for the next little while about grief in the workplace. Um, and I suppose even maybe just to start, if you can think for yourself, just as uh, before I go into the, the slides, for you in a nursing home, um, what's the most difficult thing for you in terms of grief? So just whatever comes to mind first, maybe pop it in the chat box. What's the most difficult or the most challenging thing for you um, when you think about grief in your nursing home setting from doesn't matter what it's it's around just when you think grief in your nursing home setting what do you find difficult um, and i'm going to cover a couple of areas uh, in the the next half an hour or so um, i'm going to be looking at 
personal and professional grief. Um, the difference between those two. We're going to be looking at hidden or disenfranchised grief and also how we uh, can create a supportive workplace environment around um, grief that we might experience. Um, so just looking at some of the stuff in the chat box here, we have you immediately have other people to look after. Absolutely, Eileen. And Deborah, you're saying there about responding to families who are grieving. Um, Marjorie, in my role, I have to place the grief. Hold on to that one, Marjorie. The great grief that I'm feeling to the side and hold on. And Esther, ensuring good management of symptoms. Yeah. So really, really important points coming in there uh, around your experience of grief and what comes to mind and the challenges for you. Um, so where does all this come from? Um, we're gonna have a look firstly at personal and professional grief. And what do we mean by that? Uh, this is from Rabo et al, which is 2021. I love the title of this uh, article. It's witnesses and victims, both healthcare workers and grief in the time of COVID-19. Um, and I'm just going to read a couple of quotes from this article and the reference to it are down there and you will get a copy of these slides afterwards. Um, healthcare workers recognise their responsibility to support the bereaved loved ones of our patients, but we must also attend to our own professional and personal grief in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Another quote here from it, in the intensity and pervasiveness of COVID-19, healthcare workers' fears for themselves, their colleagues, and their own loved ones are often in conflict with professional commitments. And again, that's important to highlight that conflict that we can sometimes feel between professional commitments and our own feelings, fears, or concerns. And the last one again, which is really important, our healthcare systems have a primary responsibility both to prepare healthcare workers and to support them in their anticipatory and realized grief. Special attention must be paid to our healthcare worker trainees, and this is a really important point, mentoring is very important here, who may not have yet developed personal or professional grief management strategies and are coming into healthcare practice during a time of great disruption to both teaching and clinical care. So if you like, this is the background to thinking about, particularly in a nursing home context, uh, personal and professional grief. I'm going to show you a small video and maybe just have a look at this video and see what stands out for you. Grief in the nursing home. There are two types of grief that are relevant for staff working in a nursing home. There is the personal grief of a staff member that arises from the loss of a loved one outside of the workplace. Then there is professional grief, which can arise as part of the employee's work in the nursing home. For example, when a resident in a nursing home dies, an employee may care for residents for a long time, sometimes years, and can develop strong bonds with them. They may spend more time with the resident than family members do. Healthcare staff in nursing homes can have a variety of reactions when a resident dies, which can include grief. Yet, family members are often seen as being the main grievers. And this is right, but the grief of staff can sometimes be minimized or discounted. A healthy workplace will recognize that employees need to be supported by their organization around any grief, but particularly where the grief arises as part of working in a nursing home. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing there. And again, maybe just invite you in the uh, chat box, just any reaction, it might be a word, a phrase, or anything that stays with you, having looked at that um, short video clip. Um, okay. I'm just going back to some of the other um, uh, comments that came in around the challenges. So a hospital setting, not always having adequate price or, or spaces, I beg your pardon. Um, and Mari, making time to support all appropriately. Yes, absolutely. Nicola, hard to know what supports work for staff. Really good point. Yeah. Uh, and again, private. So again, what was your reaction around that? Did, did that video, even a word or phrase which stuck with you from that, Light touch therapy and yeah, light touch therapy. Eileen, yeah, I'm not sure exactly around that one, what you're saying there. A smile, yes, lovely. As simple as infectious, a smile is infectious, absolutely. Yeah. So I suppose what what the um, that video is showing us is that there are two areas that we need to think about in nursing homes for staff. Um, and 
they are the professional grief that arises as part of the work and the personal grief in our own lives. And we really need to think about uh, supporting staff appropriately around both types of grief. So I'm gonna go on and have a lo little look more at what that might um, involve. I'm just gonna hop back here. It says he when he can find his. So, Mark, can I just check, can you see that? Okay, or do you I? You can't see it at the moment. You can't so. see it, okay. Press the share screen button, Breathly. Uh, so. Okay. That's a bit okay, so we should be there. Yeah, coming up there now. Lovely. Thanks, Mark. Stop. So um the Irish Hospice Foundation has produced an e-learning course as well. This is a free course um, which is available and goes through some of the um challenges of uh I suppose, responding to workplace grief in a nursing home setting. And um, that's the link for it there. And I think Susan's going to pop that into the chat box for you. I would encourage you to pop in, have a look at that and um, uh, see what parts uh, of that might be relevant for you. And it's a useful thing for staff as well. So what is another aspect of grief, I suppose, that we need to think about? And this would have come up in one of the comments there, you know, um, sometimes I have to push my own grief aside. And we saw it there in the little video clip where the family grief tends to take priority um, when a resident dies. Um, and there's a, an aspect of grief that we call hidden or disenfranchised grief. And Ken Doka would have spoken a lot and, and developed this concept. And he talks about grief that uh, people experience when they incur a loss that is not or cannot be openly acknowledged, publicly mourned or socially supported, or where the griever feels that they don't have a right or a license to grieve. Um, and often it can happen that the grief of staff is seen as less or not as important or minimized. And I suppose that's the thing we need to keep an eye on. Uh, the difficulty with disenfranchised grief is that can build up uh, over time. And uh, again, that can, in some cases, lead to difficulty. So what we really want to do is create a kind of open workplace environment. So just having a look, whoops, I sorry, I should get myself just organized here. I'm going to show you another clip. And again, this is of uh, a man whose mum died in a nursing home. And again, I'd just like you to have a look at uh, this man's experience and see what strikes you in terms of this video as I show it to you. And apologies for hopping all over the place, but just bear with me and we will get that going now. A Dublin man whose mother died from COVID-19 has thanked the staff at her nursing home for what he said was exemplary care. The Irish Hospice Foundation has recommended that anyone receiving end-of-life care should be allowed to have a loved one present before they die. Dermot Sreenan lost his mother Bridget on Easter Saturday after she contracted COVID-19 at a nursing home in County Kildare. He was able to hold his mother's hand to say goodbye after being supplied with a visor and full protective clothing. It's like being in full Breaking Bad costume with a visor, a welder's visor and hairnets and galoshes and everything else. So uh, it was very difficult. So I just held her hand and I just said that she'd been uh, an amazing mother and that she touched many people's lives. Bridget Sreenan was 88 years old and had a chronic underlying condition. She was being cared for at Craddock House Nursing Home in Nace. When she got diagnosed, she said to me on Skype, she said, I think this thing will finish me. And I said, you just got to do the right thing and fight it, I said, and do whatever the nurses ask you to do. And she did fight it, but she didn't, you know, she didn't win. Well, I'm going to be eternally grateful to the care home for just the level of care that they gave to my mum. They are, yeah, they're exceptional people. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, Bridget's daughter Geraldine was unable to leave the US to attend her mother's funeral. Only 11 people were present for the 10 minute graveside service. Friends and family were instead asked to wear purple, Bridget's favourite colour. My mum was uh, quite vivacious and really loved life and was always up for everything. 
Dermot and his sister plan to celebrate their mother's life with a special mass on her anniversary next April. Sharon Gaffney, RTE News, Dublin. So I'm just going to hop back here now. And again, um, if you were to think about meeting Dermot, if he was coming to your nursing home, um, what, what would you say to him? How would you respond to him from what you've seen there? And what we saw in Dermot there is somebody who's um, talking about his mum. And then there are a couple of places where Dermot got quite upset. One was where he remembered his mum, um, that he, she had been a great mother. And he had a little bit of what we would call a grief burst there. And then he came back. And the second time was when he uh, spoke to his mother on Skype. And his mum said, I think this is going to this thing is going to finish me. And you could see that Dermot got visibly upset there. So quick question to you. And just think for yourself, how would you respond? How would you what would you say to Dermot if if you met him in coming back to the nursing home? What would you say to him? And again, just use the chat function there if you like. And this isn't guess the right answer. It's really just trust your gut. What would you say to him? And just have a think about that. And maybe pop something in the chat box if you like. I'm so sorry for your loss. Absolutely, more a lovely way of uh, just very simple, just acknowledging. Yeah. My second question to you now is, how would you support a staff member who had been caring for Dermot or for Dermot's mum? What would you say to a staff member? Yeah, like that, Deborah. She sounds like a wonderful mum. Brings out, yeah, that's very nice, lovely. Yeah, just looking there at Angie, yep. Yeah. So again, more a very good checking with the staff member. How are you after that death? Um, and again, we don't know, all of you may have had very, very difficult experiences over COVID between families being present, not present and lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is really about, checking with staff how they are after a death or again it could be a situation where somebody has been dying acknowledging staff emotion and asking if they require support absolutely really good i'm not sure how to pronounce that i think it's vibal or vikbal that really really good point there um i suppose the main thing that i'd like to get across today is that we need to take account of the impact on staff of residents dying and other griefs that occur as part of the nursing home environment. Um, yeah, reassurance, very good. Offering the opportunity to attend the funeral. Yeah, um, absolutely, Edward. Um, I like that, Esther. How can I help you in your grief or how can I support you? Really, really good. Checking in, acknowledging what has happened, um, asking how you can support the staff member, how they're doing, um, and, and keeping an eye on them and just making sure that it's okay for people to talk about the impact of residents' deaths on staff. Yep, all really good suggestions there. Okay, I'm gonna hop back here. Uh, again, sorry, I've done this again. I can manage to get myself out of that. Lovely. So, um, the disenfranchised grief can happen um, in healthcare, uh, and this is uh, reflected in the literature. This is from Lathrop, and although it's referring to physician grief, it is also relevant in terms of um, all healthcare. Um, and this is where it kind of, I was saying that if, if we don't attend to the grief that we experience as staff, that can lead to burnout. And here Lathrop is talking about um, physician burnout. And he'd say, to date, physician burnout has been addressed primarily with informal strategies of stress reduction, lifestyle coaching, and trying to build physician resilience. Yet this approach erroneously implies too little resilience or a weakness within the physician. You can put healthcare worker in there uh, for physician. While diminishing or even exonerating the healthcare delivery apparatus and organizations in which physicians work. In so doing, the physician's grief and suffering is disenfranchised by the system. So his take on it is that sometimes we put too much onto individual staff members in terms of 
looking after themselves around their grief and also their own resilience. There's an organizational component in here, which is really important. So how do we create a supportive workplace for nursing home staff around grief? Uh, and I'm going to play you again another clip and again, maybe have a look at this and see what strikes you as you look at this. The workplace and grief. Grief is often a taboo topic in the workplace and can be difficult to talk about. Whether you are the one who is bereaved or you are supporting a colleague who is grieving, it is useful for everyone to learn about grief, recognize how it can impact on people and know how to respond. In all types of workplaces, support for staff who are grieving is a key element of staff well-being. There are two types of grief that are relevant in the workplace. There is the personal grief of an employee and or the professional grief that can arise as part of their work. For example, when a resident, patient or service user dies. Employees need to be supported by their organization around any grief, particularly where the grief arises as part of their work. To boost commitment and morale and reduce unnecessary leave and turnover, it is important to create a supportive workplace around both personal and professional grief. So, oops. So how do we do that? Um, and what are the things that, that can help to create that supportive workplace environment? And some of them, the suggestions that you've made there are really good, checking in with staff, uh, seeing how they're doing, um, and talking to, to people as well and saying, look, uh, what would help? Uh, and asking, are there challenges for you around grief? Also having a bereavement policy is a really good uh, way of uh, an organization showing that it um, has, if you like, a kind of minimum standard for everyone. Uh, and people knowing about a bereavement policy, uh, what their entitlements are, um, what supports are available, that can be really helpful. And interestingly, uh, we've done some work in a couple of local authorities um, who uh, have introduced bereavement policies. And what they've noticed is that requests to HR around grief and bereavement have decreased because of the, the introduction of the policy, because people know what their entitlements are. But more importantly, it opens up a conversation within um, their workplace about grief. Um, and if you are, if you have a bereavement policy already, that's brilliant. And maybe it might be worth thinking about um, uh, going over that or, or doing a presentation on that to staff and opening up a con uh, conversation around that. If you don't, it's worth thinking about um, putting one together. And what I would say is, it's not so much the policy itself, but the actual experience of um, developing it with staff that can really um, help an organization. Um, and that's where you can open it out to different groups to give their input on it. This is again from uh, COVID-19, and this looks at um, some of the pluses and uh, burdens and benefits that people have experienced um, as palliative care uh, professionals through COVID. Um, and again, it just gives us a, a bit of an insight into what some of the burdens or the, the challenges for people are. And again, look at that distinction of personal and professional. So personal burdens related to increased fear and uncertainty, fear of bringing the virus home and a sense of collective grief. That one is really important the sense of collective grief. And I think we also need to look at that in terms of how we support ourselves, all of us, because we all lived through COVID and our staff as well. Professional burdens included a sense of exhaustion, a challenge with work-life balance, personal experiences with colleagues infected with the virus, and consider considerations of leaving healthcare altogether. These are fairly serious challenges and burdens. Um, we also have to balance that with the benefits that people found, and this is important as well. People found benefits such as uh, learning lessons from COVID, an evolving self, a sense, excuse me, of what matters, and improved work-life balance. And some of the professional benefits included opportunities for professional development, and a sense of professional purpose. Um, and I suppose that the people will talk about compassion fatigue, but we also have to talk about compassion satisfaction. Um, and that's really important as well. And that's basically the, the sense of value we get from doing our work and working with others in a meaningful way. Um, from a grief point of view, we need to keep an eye on that first one, the collective grief, and also 
any professional grief that may uh, be sitting with people as a result of COVID. So how do we develop a healthy uh, culture and work in nursing homes around grief for staff? Um, an organization-wide openness around death, grief and suffering. Um, that's what in all of your uh, organizations you're dealing with from time to time and sometimes uh, in very concentrated ways. Um, looking at organizational supports, and these include um, developing a bereavement policy, which addresses both personal and professional grief with staff, recognizing the impact of grief, where grief may be disenfranchised or hidden on staff, where it may be minimized, education and training and grief awareness for managers and staff. Uh, again, that idea, it's good that everybody learns a bit about grief and understands how it works. Providing grief supports for staff. So, uh, for example, information on grief, that free e-learning course, which uh, we sent the link out to you there earlier on. That's a really good introduction uh, that's available to everybody. Um, and it just gets uh, people into that kind of area of thinking and talking about grief. The Irish Hospice Foundation provide a bereavement support helpline. Uh, that's the number there. That's a free service. So again, that's another um, uh, support that is there. Um, and also checking with staff about what would be helpful for them around grief um, and opening up a conversation with them about what would make a difference. A really important point is mentoring new or inexperienced staff around death or grief. Um, and I think there's great potential there for uh, drawing on the experience of uh, uh, staff who have kind of gone through these uh, difficult experiences and have learned helpful ways of coping. The other thing that's really important is encouraging peer support around grief across the organization. And that's the creating, um, I suppose, an open, helpful and healthy atmosphere in the workplace where it's okay to acknowledge that we're impacted by grief, for it's okay to understand that at times, a bit like we saw with Dermot there in the video, there are times we're gonna be caught up with the emotion of grief and that's normal, that's okay. We're not any way less professional for doing that. In fact, we are actually more professional because that's a, if you like, a humanity um, uh, of our professionalism. And that's really, really important for people uh, that both families and for patients that you work with. Um, so what are some examples of good practice? Um, uh, one of the best examples we have at the moment is, believe it or not, the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, um, who set out on a process of developing a bereavement policy after, you may remember the Berkeley tragedy a number of years ago, um, and they were responding to that and the fact that a lot of their staff were quite impacted by the calls they had to take. Um, this is a couple of quotes from the introduction to their policy. Um, and I'll just read them out for you. Uh, in terms of supporting our staff, this policy is a statement that the department recognizes the deeply personal impact that bereavement and loss can have on colleagues. And that as an organization, we are here to support all our staff during this difficult time. And the second quote is around encouraging openness. We hope that this policy will start conversations and encourage an openness about a topic that is often regarded as out of bounds or best avoided in the workplace. A supportive approach which gives permission to a bereaved person to experience their grief at work is a central plank, whoops, central plank of our ambition to be a great place to work. And that's from John Conlon, the Director General of Human Resources. So what are some resources for you? Um, the Irish Hospice Foundation, uh, we run and I'm heading out a programme called Grief in the Workplace, which is a, a programme which aims to support workplaces and employees around bereavement. And we have a number of different aspects uh, to that programme, which include advocacy, education, training and support. Uh, this is the link for the uh, uh, web page, the landing page, and there are a number of free resources there, and there are other resources around um, uh, other aspects of grief, but also we have training and education, and there are different options there. We also have recently uh, launched e-learning courses for managers and staff on uh, coping with grief in the workplace, and again, uh, this is the link for that. It's https uh, 
forward slash forward slash elearning.hospicefoundation.ie. And again, you will have these links afterwards um, in the slides. Uh, and again, there are different, we have four courses there at the moment, which look at particular aspects of supporting staff. We also have our bereavement support line, which is 1-800-80-70-77. Um, and I should say just to, to go back up there maybe a moment. Uh, that's my email address there, brefney.mcginnis at hospicefoundation.ie. If you have questions in relation to an aspect of grief in the workplace, please pop me an email and uh, I'll do my best to, to answer or to provide a supportive response. So just in summary, uh, we've looked at grief and that it's normal in the nursing home workplace for staff as well as for residents and their families. We've seen that grief can become hidden or disenfranchised and that's something we need to keep an eye on, um, especially for uh, staff. Healthcare workers in nursing homes need to be supported around both their personal losses and professional losses. Um, the nursing home organization has a key role to play in providing supports and also self-care is very important um, uh, and that's especially important around grief. Um, it's not one or the other, it's both together organizational supports and indeed self-care. So I am going to stop there and thank you very much for listening and I'll hand back over to Mark. Thanks a million, Brefney. That was great. Um, and it's great to hear you talking about such topics. You know, it's something that um, comes up a lot in our workshops um, that we do with a lot of the nursing home staff. It's always something that comes up is about how to support each other through what can be uh, just a bigger bereavement for staff. As you said, the bonds that they form um, with the residents they're supporting and things like that. And it, it is a difficult pathway at times to support people equally with that. Um, I. Marie O'Keefe as well here, who, who mentions it as well in the chat function there about the post it reviews and things, which is a big part of our the Kyol program um, and doing the death reviews afterwards. Um, and uh, it, it being that space for people to be able to sit down and, and kind of uh, uh, remember people and obviously look into their care and things like that. But it's also a place for staff to kind of process their own grief as well around that. And it could be a huge, hugely beneficial thing. And luckily enough, that is going to be a big part of the new National Nursing Home Programme going forward as well. Um, it's going to be a big part doing those cold reviews and, and you know, um, uh, it, it, the feedback we get on those always are that it can it, it's hugely beneficial to, to staff members. So. Yeah, we that, will be. That, it's great, Mark. I mean, I, I've sat in on a couple of the reviews and they are mm. fantastic. And I think, yeah. as you say, they give that opportunity for people to process a little bit of the experience of grief and processing it together is really important um, as staff. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and you can really, if you, I've been in the room with for a few of them as well, like, and is it, you know, the, the, the laughing, the tears, everything that come with it, you know, again, yeah. it can be really cathartic for people to be able to, to go through those kind of experiences together, you know, um, and an awful lot of time, you know, people, they, they don't necessarily need um, massive resources. Sometimes it's those little things and often can make a huge difference, you know. Yeah. Um, so thank Absolutely. you very much, Brefney. I don't know if anybody else has any other questions here. Um, and now's the time if anyone would like to ask Brefney anything in particular. Um, just to point out as well, everything that Brefney was mentioning there, all the different links, most of them have been put into the chat function there for people to have a look at now. We will follow up obviously afterwards as well with all the information uh, with um, Brefney's presentation and all those links and things as well afterwards. So, so don't worry, there will be an opportunity for you to look through those as well. So I don't see anybody, um, any hands coming up or anything coming in the chat function. So thank you very much, Brefney. That was 